we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm really, really excited uh, to be on this uh, webinar with you today. And uh, I think for the next 35 or 40 minutes, we're going to try to share with you a compelling argument uh, about getting going on establishing habitat in your own backyard. So I'm going to uh, share my presentation and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So this picture obviously is a representative picture of um, a beautiful prairie. The picture in my background is actually a prairie in my own yard. I'm very actually happy about that and uh, glad I could share it with you in the background. So we're not able to be together and I'm sad about that, but you know, as they say, it is what it is and uh, we're trying to do the best that we can. So what we decided to do about three months ago when this all blew up on us was to turn this into a virtual series of um, webinars rather than being able to do a large conference in person. So last week you heard from our founder, Clark McLeod, uh, a presentation that I thought was very compelling uh, about the critical need for native plants and trees in our landscapes. Uh, today is what we're calling Pollinator Zones 101, Establishing Native Habitat in Your Own Backyard. You should think about this as really a two-part series because next weekend uh, we're going to do Pollinator Zones 201 or Advanced Pollinator Zones. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, taking care of your prairie once you get it planted, uh, years two, three, and four. And then we're very excited to be partnering with the ISU Master Gardeners uh, and they're going to talk a little bit about different techniques for habitat restoration in your uh, landscape uh, and a technique called polyscaping, which uh, is an innovative new idea uh, that we're actually in the process of getting trademarked. The following week, we're then going to be doing um, really a, a webinar on what started all this, which is an introduction to monarch rearing. Uh, Clark McLeod and Cam Watts uh, several years ago got really interested. Cam had been a lifelong uh, butterfly expert and uh, on the plight of the monarch. And that's what really started uh, a very active program uh, known as Monarch Zones that uh, has grown and grown. And I know many of you on this call today uh, are probably already Monarch Zones. And then our last one in that series is Advanced Monarch Zones using biotents. Uh, our biotent process has been really very interesting, very innovative. Uh, probably one of the most natural and um, productive and cost-effective ways to uh, rear monarchs uh, at a little bit higher scale, uh, helping them to then go on their journey to multiply and to begin their couple thousand mile trip to Mexico. A wonderful and amazing story that I know you'll get excited about. Uh, so uh, please, if you have not, register at our website, monarchresearch.org, on the events section. And I should mention also, uh, especially for the probably hundred or so people that <laughs> were registered or not joining today, that uh, enjoy this weather and we will have these webinars recorded. Uh, you can watch them at any time on our website. Uh, ours will be up on 101 probably uh, in the next few days. You know, if I look at the registrations and uh, kind of the activity so far with our first webinar last week, you are conservation minded. You want to make a difference and you're biased towards action. And that's all we can ask. So what today's goal is, is to provide information and answers for your questions. I'm going to say this several times during this presentation. Every prairie is different and every prairie is different every year. Uh, this particular flower is known as the spiderwort. It's a beautiful plant and uh, you see it in the landscapes uh, all around our community uh, over the course of the summer. So I want to back up just for a second uh, to last week and review just one graphic that I think kind of encapsulates everything that we're trying to talk about here today. You know, at its most base level, the sun provides almost all the energy for the life in our planet, uh, our biosphere. Uh, probably the universe for that matter. It drives all plant life and that plant life is actually importantly sustained by the insects that pollinate that plant life. And so it's a interconnected web of insects and plants uh, that provide life sustaining energy for literally the entire food chain all the way up to us. And you know, that us at the top is really an interesting one because we have managed over the centuries 
to alter 75% of the plant surface, whether that's roads, parking lots, housing, uh, crops, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, we as humans have changed the face of the planet. And what it has done is created a very, very, very significant crisis, particularly in the insect section of this pyramid, uh, where we literally are losing insects at 1% a year uh, in Iowa, 4% a year. It is a very scary prospect. So our notion here is to get people fired up uh, to restore native habitat. So our primary goal at Monarch Research is to rebuild native habitat in Lynn County, figuring out a way to do this at scale in a very, very small geographic area. We're doing that through private landowners and we're doing it with public land as well. So today's uh, presentation obviously is about that private land section known as planting forward. Uh, our pollinator zones activity has an objective of trying to create 5,000 pollinator zones over the next five years. You know, we've been very active with our partners in uh, local and county government uh, on public land, as you probably are aware. Uh, we are going to reach the thousand acre mark uh, in this next year of acres planted in native prairie uh, in parks, uh, golf courses, uh, public areas. Uh, really a very, very successful program uh, that we're really, really happy with how it's turned out. And we're also working on the roadsides. Uh, we call it the thousand mile program, uh, building what we're calling mini prairies. Uh, if you do the math on a thousand miles of those, it's 75,000 of them. Uh, we've gotten 190 miles of it planted so far. Uh, again, it's a very innovative, uh, cost-effective uh, and large scale program that uh, we're still working on. We're still figuring it out, but uh, it has a ton of opportunity uh, and potential. We talked a little bit about uh, boosting the monarch population uh, with monarch zones. And the whole idea here is as we figure out these tools and techniques is making Lynn County a model for America. We're not trying to shine the spotlight right now because we're still in the process of zooming in and getting all these processes figured out. But our intent is to freely and openly share those tools and techniques with anybody who wants to uh, because we have a huge, uh, a lot, a huge amount of work to do. Uh, to address this problem across this country and around the world. We have a good friend who spent time with us this past fall here in Cedar Rapids. Uh, his name is Dr. Doug Tallamy, and he has uh, issued what is known as the Tallamy Challenge. Look at these photographs. These are of lawns, okay? Uh, everybody loves their lawn. In fact, everybody loves their lawn too much. The truth of the matter is, is that this whole notion of the lawn started back in the 1600s uh, where noblemen who had the resources would hire people to come in and trim their grass, uh, obviously by hand using a scythe. Uh, it was very expensive, very labor intensive, uh, but it showed a mark of, of stature, uh, of uh, authority, uh, of uh, noblemen, obviously. And that cultural process has come across to the United States and around the world. And as a result of that, you see huge, huge amounts of grass across this country, a massive amount of land that unfortunately folks, and I'm gonna be very direct about this, is an ecological dead zone. It does not support much of anything. It doesn't help with water runoff. Uh, it doesn't help with water quality, and it sure doesn't help uh, pollinators who have no use for a mowed lawn. So the, Notion here is to convert 50% uh, of your dead zone into living landscape. I can't be any more direct than that. And I, by the way, I love lawns as well. And when they're freshly mowed, it is a really, really beautiful site. But the truth is, is that it's creating a problem, not solving a problem. Doug says it better than I can. So I'm gonna play a brief clip uh, from his presentation that he made to our Green Leadership Summit here this last fall. And it really is about, don't worry about the entire globe, just worry about your own property. And if you do that, we will be 85% done. So let's listen to Doug. What we need to do, what we're talking about here is rebuilding the Earth's carrying capacity, its ability to support life. And we do that by putting the plants back. Where are we gonna put those plants back? We're gonna put them back on our private properties. We're gonna put them back on all the, the land that you uh, might make policy for, that you manage in some way. 
85.6% of the, of the uh, U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 81% of Iowa is privately owned. We've got the parks and preserves, but they're too small, they're too isolated. They're not gonna be conservation in the future. That's where biodiversity is huddling, we're gonna keep them. But we've, we own all the area in between them, and that's what we have to focus our conservation efforts on. We're not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. We absolutely have to do this. Roy Dennis is a land manager in, in England who recently said land ownership is more than a privilege, it's a responsibility. Couldn't agree more. This is the earth that you're looking at the biosphere, that very thin film of life that surrounds the earth. If the earth was an egg, the biosphere would be thinner than the eggshell. And as far as we know, that's where all the life in the universe is. Certainly all the life we're ever going to interact with is right there on the biosphere. But we've chopped the biosphere up into private land ownership. Tom owns this, Dick owns this, Harry owns this, Mary owns that. Okay, along with that private land ownership comes the responsibility of stewarding all the life in the universe. I can't think of a more awesome responsibility than that. UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests there are places on, on poor planet Earth that have no ecological significance. Not so. Every inch of the planet has ecological significance, including your yard. It no longer gets a pass. You've got to have functioning ecosystems there. We can no longer leave conservation to the conservationists. There are not nearly enough of them. So now we're all conservationists. You don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you live. And I love this approach because it empowers each one of us. And you get positive feedback, by the way. It works. And that's motivational. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the, the entire globe. Just worry about your own property. And if you do that, we'll be 85% done. So that's all we're asking here. So as property owners, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix this. We're not going to fix it alone. Nobody's going to fix it alone, but we can fix it together. Isn't he awesome? Uh, what a great speaker. I just love that guy. You know, when you think about it, everyone, uh, and listening to Doug there, you know, extinctions are local. You think about uh, various species that have gone extinct and they are generally geographically isolated. They generally have um, either host plants or uh, host environments that are important. As a result, the solutions must be local. And that applies to you and I as well. So this is our responsibility as landowners. And the pledge that we're asking you to think about today and the pledge that I've taken and the reason that I have that beautiful prairie behind me is basically to take 50% of your currently mowed and sprayed grass and turn them into native habitat, otherwise known as pollinator zones. Because the loss of native plants in this wide scale um, conversion to concrete and grass uh, is creating a huge crisis uh, across the globe and it has to be addressed. So that is our challenge. But I have to tell you that doing this work is going to require patience. Uh, one thing that's great about grass is that it grows like crazy and uh, native plants don't grow like crazy at first. It takes a while. So they are ugly at first. They're stunning in a couple of years, but it really, really does require patience. I cannot stress that enough, and I will do so a couple of more times. So we're here to help you start on this path or answer questions if you've already begun this journey. You know, here's an example, uh, and probably an unfair example, because we had uh, one of the great pros of prairie planting uh, here in the area uh, work on this prairie, but this is uh, Seminole Valley Park right here in Cedar Rapids. This is a second-year prairie. Uh, again, I almost didn't put this in here because it creates a false expectation, but isn't that gorgeous? That is absolutely beautiful. This basically is a, is a seed mix that has over 80 species in it uh, and is continuing to grow and change and thrive along with the other thousand acre projects uh, that we have all around the community. So get out there and check them out. So let's talk about establishing prairie in your own backyard. We're gonna talk about site selection today. We're gonna to talk about seedbed preparation, probably the most important aspect of getting a native prairie established. Uh, two methods that we're gonna to talk to there. 
We're going to talk a little bit about seed mix and how important it is to have a variety of seeds in that mix when you get ready to plant and how you can, by the way, get that seed mix from us. And then how to get it planted. That's as far as I'm going to go today. Uh, next week, we'll talk a little bit about how to take care of it. I just want to mention that this picture is actually on Old Mount Vernon Road. It's one of the earliest prairie plantings along the right of way here in the county. It's known as the Seedling Mile. That is a beautiful example of a butterfly milkweed plant uh, and obviously the uh, pale pur purple coneflower. Sorry, say that three times. So um, let's talk about then this process. Site selection. First of all, I'd like to say that, you know, pick your spot. Pick a spot. Just be committed. Talk to your family. Uh, just say, hey, guys, we're going to build a prairie and we're going to do it over here. Uh, now, obviously, the best way to do that would be to pick well sun, full sun and well-drained soil. But I must tell you that they can be planted just about anywhere. Uh, now, again, if you have a super, super shady yard, uh, our seed mix may not work. You may need to uh, actually go to one of the seed vendors and get a shady mix. But the truth is, uh, it doesn't matter. You can find seeds that will grow uh, in shade. Uh, certainly, we have a ton of seeds in our uh, seed mix that love uh, full sun. It doesn't have to be a rectangle either. We're going to talk more about that next week in terms of our polyscaping concept, but it can be along a fence line, although you should probably use three to four feet uh, out from the fence uh, in terms of establishing your, uh, uh, establishing your site to prepare it. Also, select an area where you can create an area around it. You want people to know this is a prairie. And by the way, we do have signs available uh, on our website. You can order them. Um, and I, again, want to stress that this will look like a weed patch for the first couple of years and obviously in the winter as these plants all go dormant. Remember, these are perennials, uh, and that's the really cool thing about this versus uh, buying annuals for your garden every year. Uh, these will continue to uh, change and thrive and develop and spread, uh, and you just have to hang in there. So I want you to remember the magic isn't just the prairie you plant. It's the pollinators, the butterflies and the bees, and the birds it will attract. Just a quick aside, I have five different prairie areas. Uh, fortunately, I'm lucky to have some land out here and have been working on those prairies for approximately 10 years. The youngest is three years old, the oldest is 10. Uh, but I was just out the other day uh, and counted 25 different species of birds uh, in my yard. I, I have birds that I never ever imagined I would have uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, 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 you know, uh, indigo buntings, Baltimore Orioles, it's just remarkable. And the reason is, is because I have habitat. They love it. The bees love it. And the butterflies clearly love it. And one more time, every prairie is different and every prairie is different every year. I cannot tell you how surprised I am every year at how different each of these prairie areas is as I look out. Uh, and right now, they're just now starting to pop and, and uh, everything's green and uh, we're, we're moving forward. So let's take a look at a couple things here. Here's an example of a possible prairie site. This is basically along the side of a road. Uh, it has been obviously not mowed. Uh, it's an area that has not been developed. Uh, possibly a good area. It's a pretty large area, but uh, we'll see how that uh, prairie has come along. This is a good friend of ours in Des Moines. So let's talk about how, if you pick that area, how do you prepare it? What you really need to think about is getting the site down to bare dirt without disturbing the soil. So this is not about going out and railroad tilling. This is not about going up out with a spade and turning over the dirt. The problem with that is that it unleashes millions literally millions of weed seeds. And there's no need uh, to do that. Uh, so think about that, bare dirt without disturbing the soil. So there's really two primary methods that I'm gonna talk about today. Summer kill is one that we uh, have dubbed that term, I guess, and the other is using herbicide. So I'll talk to each one of those. And let me just uh, go there on the herbicide for a second. Uh, it takes uh, probably three uh, treatments to kill all the vegetation. Uh, and I know a lot of people have concerns about that, but the truth of the matter is, is that this is done over one season. You are treating this one time to get all of the nasty weeds and vegetation killed so that you can replace it with native seeds. And once those native seeds take hold and start to grow, you never have to really do anything from a treatment perspective again, unless, you have invasions of Canadian thistle or whatever. Uh, 
But the bottom line is, is that I, uh, along with most prairie experts, will tell you that particularly large prairies, it's really the only way to do it because you have to get that, uh, that, that uh, weed bed uh, taken care of first before you can put down seed. But let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the plastic method uh, as well. So, you know, you, what you want here is when you broadcast your seed, you get good seed to soil contact. So let's take a look at a couple of these uh, slides. Uh, but remember that 80% of a successful prairie is successful seed bed prep. It's really, really important to understand that. You can't just go out and throw seed on the ground. It won't work. So here we go. Uh, here's a 10 by 10 foot example of turf grass. We've marked it off so you can see what a 10 by 10 area looks like, 100 square feet. And what we're going to do here is use plastic sheeting on this 10 by 10. Here's an example of a 20 by 20 foot prairie that has been treated with herbicides all summer uh, and is being prepared to be planted. So you can see it's not, you know, it's not pristine and it doesn't need to be. But the bottom line is that what you're trying to do is get that vegetation um, removed. And as you can see, the soil has not been disturbed. So when you're working on this 10 by 10, set the mower to the lowest setting or weed whack it. Get it down there uh, really tight. Mow it short and then cover it in either two layers of three mil black plastic or one layer of six mil black plastic. You can buy either at any of the big box stores, uh, a box that would produce, I think, uh, a thousand square feet of plastic sheeting uh, is about 30 bucks. And then you buy some landscape staples and make sure that it's stapled down tight. And then you let it bake. Here's another uh, picture of that uh, area that we were looking at earlier uh, that was, you, you, sprayed using herbicides all summer, and it is also ready for uh, planting, and uh, you won't have to spray it again. Again, I want to make sure I compare that to the widespread use of glyphosate in crop production. Uh, in a soybean field could be sprayed as many as three times a season. So uh, again, by comparison, uh, it's, you know, obviously it's a means to an end, but we believe that the sort of uh, one season use of herbicide is definitely justified to create a prairie that can last a lifetime. Here's that same prairie area that we were looking at before with the 20 by 20 area marked off from the road. So you can see that uh, that 400 square foot area is fairly sizable. And if you think about that in your yard, it would be uh, for many landowners, a pretty good chunk of uh, what is already being mowed and sprayed. So let's talk a little bit about what it is that we're gonna plant. You know, there's a tremendous number, hundreds of species of grasses and flowers related to native habitat here in Iowa, hundreds of them. Uh, so you have to pick. And what we did for our seed mix was work with the, uh, with ISU and with the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation to select 40 varieties of milkweed, uh, native flowers, which are known as forbs, and grasses. We tried to pick varieties that bloom throughout the season, uh, starting in May and going all the way through September, October. Uh, basically, that's to give nectar to all of the pollinators all the way throughout the season through different varieties, as well as three varieties of milkweed, common, swamp, and butterfly milkweed. All three very pretty plants, all three very different, all three the only plant that a monarch butterfly can lay an egg on and that egg can turn into a chrysalis and eventually a butterfly. So a very, very important species that has literally been wiped out uh, across this country and needs to be replaced. So the bottom line is here is that if you take the challenge to convert either 100 square feet or 400 square feet uh, of your currently sprayed and mowed grass to a pollinator zone, and then uh, register to become a pollinator zone on our website under monarchresearch.org slash pollinator dash zones. And then later in the year, uh, document your seedbed prep by sending us an email on our contact um, tab on our website, along with a photograph of your prepared seedbed. We will make arrangements to get that seed to you, and then you will plant that seed and maintain your new pollinator zone. So it's uh, a pretty sweet deal because this seed mix is very expensive. I, I'm not even kidding there. It really is very expensive. That Seminole Valley Park uh, seed mix that you looked at was about $800 an acre. So it is by far the most expensive part. And so what we're trying to do is take this thing out of that to give you an incentive to do this, but it's not free. You have to get it prepared. You have to document that you prepared it, and then you have to take care of it. 
And then you can watch as your prairie becomes a monarch butterfly haven with common butterfly and swamp milkweed. Um, you can look at a complete list of species in the monarch re of our monarch research seed mix on our website under pollinator zones. Um, we have basically listed the species name, uh, the actual Latin name for the species, as well as photographs of each one of those species. And here's a few more examples. Uh, New England Aster is what you'll see at the end of the season. Cream Gentian is what you'll see early in the season and sneeze we would be more in that summertime. But these are all very, very strong pollinator plants uh, as part of our seed mix. So let's talk about planting your native plot. Uh, now, I wanna stop here for a second and say that there are multiple right ways to do this. What I'm trying to do here is tell you a way that I believe has the best chance of working when you're basically trying to convert a piece of yard. So the preferred time to plant, interestingly enough, is very late fall, uh, basically November, December timeframe. It could even be after that uh, as the weather cycle starts to change here in Iowa more and more. But what this does is when you put the seed down on that prepared seed bed that has not been disturbed, it allows the seed to have frost thaw cycles. Many of these seeds need that cold wet stratification process for germination in the spring. In addition to that, what that does is when it snows and when it uh, freezes and when it thaws, it helps push that seed down a little bit uh, into the soil and allows for good germination in the spring. So what you're going to need here is your seed mix packets that you can get from us or from any of the seed vendors that you can see in our resource section on our website. You need a bucket and you need some damp sand, not wet sand, just damp sand. And what I need you to do is thoroughly mix the seed mix and the sand together. You can just pour in the seed mix and start scooping that sand together and make sure that it's thoroughly mixed. And then spread it evenly across the area that you prepared, throwing handfuls across that soil and making sure that it's very evenly distributed. Once that's completed, just take a regular leaf rake and very lightly pull the rake across the plot. Just up and down, back and forth. You don't have to do any kind of heavy work here. You're just basically lightly pulling the rake across this, uh, this bare ground that now has the seed and the sand on top. It helps to distribute. It also helps to work it in just a tiny little bit. Most of these seeds do not want to go any deeper than an eighth of an inch max. So that gives you an idea of why uh, uh, basically good seed to soil contact is important. At that point, you and your family can even now walk on the plot to ensure that that seed is in good contact with the soil. And then you're done. Congratulations. And now you wait. So prairie takes time. Uh, it's just critically important to remember how different this process is than it is sowing a new lawn uh, or uh, going to the garden center and buying annuals and putting them in your garden. It's gonna be ugly at first, stunning in a few years, and supporting nature forever. You know, it, these prairies have, were here in Iowa, uh, across the landscape for literally hundreds of years. Um, we took them all out. Uh, it's gonna take a while to put them back, but once they do get established and are self-maintaining, uh, they're A, beautiful, B, they're great for the environment, water quality, water runoff, uh, as well as pollinators. Um, and they're low maintenance. You don't have to mow them. So the number one question that I get asked anyway, when people plant new prairie is, is anything good growing? I can't tell. I can't see anything. All I see is weeds. So what I want to do is just in the next few slides to show you a few examples of common young species. Uh, you know, again, this is an established prairie here. You can see that uh, you have a variety of species showing here. Uh, flowers and grasses, uh, and it's actually nicely diverse and it looks great. So that's the goal. So you know that prairie that I showed you earlier? Well, here is what it looked like in the first year. By the way, this is a pretty successful planting. Uh, you can see that there's a variety of species across this slide. Uh, that little black thing, by the way, in the slide is a cat. So I did that because it gives you a good example of what we're looking at from a scale perspective. So here's a few species. Uh, one that is very distinctive, 
uh, and is pretty easy to identify because of the shape of the leaf structure uh, is partridge pea. So in its early stages, you'll see a shoot coming up out of the ground with a very uh, unique, almost fern-like um, leaf structure coming out of it. And here to the left are examples of mature partridge pea plants. They're really pretty. Uh, they bloom for a long time, but they're a sort of a signature species in terms of plant identification to see if you have anything growing, because what you can see around this plant uh, are a lot of weeds. And uh, uh, certainly, um, uh, that's really what you should expect. But when you see a partridge pea coming up, that means you probably have other species that are starting to pop as well. Of course, you're going to have Rudbeckia. We have um, multiple different kinds of Rudbeckia plants. Uh, your black-eyed Susans, brown-eyed Susans, there's a whole bunch of different species in this family. Uh, but here is an early stage uh, Rudbeckia plant. And here it is, uh, obviously mature. Uh, it, again, it is a signature species across the, the state and across the country in terms of native habitat. Uh, it's a beautiful plant and it blooms for a long period of time. And again, pollinators love it. Here's another pollinator favorite. Uh, this is otherwise known as bee balm, wild bergamot. Uh, example here on the right-hand side of a very early species, you can see the grass plants uh, right behind it, the uh, foxtail <laughs> in front of it. So it's, it's starting to grow in weeds and uh, they just go nuts. This plant spreads, it's very aggressive, it's very active, it's also very pretty, and it's obviously a pollinator favorite. Uh, and uh, you see it all over the place, you see it all over Iowa, but uh, mixed in with all of the other species, it's a beautiful plant. So those are some, some examples of uh, what you might expect to see uh, as you begin to watch your native prairie emerge. Here's that same prairie that had the cat on it. Uh, at the end of the year, of the second year, this is in the fall, this is when the prairie is starting to go dormant, and you can see there's tons of milkweed in here with uh, full seed pods on them. Um, here it is in the summer, uh, just exploding with common milkweed. Uh, it looks like uh, he actually got carried away with milkweed on this end of the prairie, but that's an okay thing. Uh, we need lots and lots of common milkweed to help support those uh, monarchs that uh, used to have this in the farm field, and it's gone. So we have to put it somewhere else, and that's in our yards, along our roadsides, in our parks. Uh, we need to help the monarch butterfly as well as all of the other pollinators. So I went through that pretty quickly. Um, I meant to go through it pretty quickly because it's a beautiful day and I know you guys want to get outside. But I do want to leave it open now for some questions uh, or comments that you might have. Uh, you have a Q&A tab uh, as part of your Zoom uh, connection. And uh, let me go to the, uh, let me go to the Q&A and see what we got. Okay. Um, Here's the first question, I'm gonna take them in order. I moved into a house that was highly landscaped with all non-native, non-pollinator friendly shrubs, trees, and plants. Should I take everything out and start over? Uh, well, I would say no, uh, I don't think you need to do that. I would say you could take some of the nasty non-natives out because I can guarantee you that there are some. If you have barberry bushes, you could uh, chop those out and burn them. Uh, they enter forests and are very, very damaging. Uh, if you have um, a ginkgo tree and you would be interested in replacing that with a native tree, that would be fine. So I don't think you have to blow everything up, but I would say that starting to integrate natives into this non-native landscape is a very, very uh, good thing to do and a very pollinator friendly thing to do. The next was you did not burn, mention burning as an option, why? So, good question. Uh, first of all, in the city limits, which is where I'm thinking that many of you landowners live, uh, that's not a good option. Um, however, in the county, you can apply to the Lynn County Health Department and get a burn permit. And burning a prairie every few years is great. It's a wonderful thing. It works super. I do it out here. Um, it's not something you have to do every year and you shouldn't do it every year because uh, you end up starting to create a monoculture of species. But burning is an option in the county, and I didn't mention it because in most cases I'm talking today about very small prairie areas uh, that you, you know, probably wouldn't burn if it was in your backyard on uh, Grand Avenue in Cedar Rapids. 
So here's one. I have a five acre site I'd like to convert to pollinator habitat. Is there a local source for seed? So there are actually very, I'm very pleased to say there are some wonderful seed vendors around the state and around the area. Uh, they are great. Uh, you know, again, I, if I started mentioning them, I'd, I'd leave some out. We do have available on our website a resource guide that has several of those vendors mentioned and you can contact them. They all have awesome websites. You can spend hours looking at their beautiful native seed sources. Um, but, you know, a five acre site is not a small commitment. It's going to be a big project. Uh, I'm not sure if you're planning to do it yourself or if you're going to get uh, resources to help you with it uh, in terms of developing it as well. And those resources are also available. Uh, and a few of those, again, are listed in our resource guide. Okay, next question. Um, in the part of my yard where I like to put my habitat, it is rolling low to high, water does uh, sit in some spaces. Do I use the same seed mix for all or different for the areas where water sits after a rain? Well, again, it depends on how picky you are here. Um, <laughs> you know, if you take, uh, for example, our seed mix, which has 40 different varieties in it, uh, and you plant it across low to high, uh, wet soil, dry soil, um, what's going to happen is, is that you will have some areas that will do well with certain species and other areas that will do well with other species. Now, to be truthful, you may have some other areas that are, for example, super wet or super shady or whatever, where you might want to buy some seed mix from one of these vendors uh, that is specific to that area. My recommendation, frankly, is if you're going to take that approach, or if it's a larger prairie, is to contact one of these seed vendors directly. You would tell them what the soil type looks like, what the slope looks like, what the sun looks like, uh, and they can work with you to recommend a native seed mix that works for you. That's what they're there for, and that's what they do for a living, uh, and they're all great. Uh, I have just been so impressed with the uh, native seed vendors around this state and around this area. Okay, um, is there anything that you have to do with it to maintain it in the fall? I'm going to make the assumption here, um, Jenny and Katie, that you're talking about a prairie that's already been established. And interestingly enough, the answer to that question is you don't have to do anything. <laughs> if the prairie's already established, if you uh, uh, have got prairie that's basically starting to grow and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, now, we're going to talk next week about taking care of a prairie. And you will do some work on it during the summer. Uh, but at the end of the year, in terms of what you normally do with a garden where you're going in and raking out leaves or cutting down plants or whatever, you don't have to do that. Uh, let's see, next question, do you use fertilizer? Uh, generally speaking, a prairie does not need fertilizer. Uh, it is not even recommended. And uh, so interestingly enough, uh, it's another aspect of native habitat development uh, that is interesting because these seeds, once they, and I, and I should say here that most of the work that these seeds do for the first two to three years, two to three years, is establishing a root system. Uh, now, if the soil is really crummy, uh, which, you know, most soil here in Iowa is not, uh, you really don't need to use fertilizer. But you do need to remember that these plants are going to spend most of their effort in the first few years establishing a root system. Uh, let's see, how aggressively do these spread into adjacent lawn or neighbor's lots? How to manage that creep? Just mow? Yes, the answer is just mow. Basically have a border. You can put border uh, stones around it if you want to. You can put, uh, you know, uh, border bricks in if you want to, uh, but you can also just basically keep it mowed. And interestingly enough, that's what I do around my prairie areas, and I do not have any problem with creep. Uh, these plants are aggressive, but they're not invasive, okay? So let's be clear about that. They're aggressive once they get started, but they're not invasive. And so, um, okay, let's see. Um, can we participate if we live in Jones County? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, we're not trying to be exclusive to Lynn County here. Uh, and Jones is right next door. So uh, the answer is uh, stay in touch, go to our website, uh, get a pollinator zone activated, and uh, we'll work with you. Are deer attracted to the pollinator zones and will they eat the flowers? Uh, interestingly enough, the deer will probably walk through the pollinator zones, but you will be surprised at how little they eat. Uh, it's really, <laughs> interestingly enough, that's how this native habitat survived for 100 years, is that it was not highly susceptible to 
um, animal predation. So, uh, you know, will they eat some? Yeah. Will they eat some of the grass? No, nah, not really. Uh, deer are not your number one concern uh, as you plant native habitat, as opposed to a lot of the uh, sort of uh, species that you might find at nurseries that uh, aren't, you know, traditional native, traditional uh, shrub species for your uh, perennial garden and so on and so forth. Let's see, if I have seeds left over from last year, will they still work? Uh, so the answer is maybe. Um, if you store them in your refrigerator uh, and kept them semi-dry, they're probably still okay. The shelf life of seeds stored in a cool place is usually two to three years. But if they were just laying in the garage, um, you might wanna start over again. So uh, I have a question here. I understand spraying herbicides to clear large areas, but personally don't like it. I don't either. Um, what is it doing to water runoff, grubs, birds, wildlife? Are you concerned about that? Again, I'm gonna stress one more time that the means to the ends here is to get uh, seed to soil contact without disturbing the soil. And you're doing this for one season. Uh, interestingly enough, if you read the research on Roundup, and believe me, I have, um, this, product does not stay in the soil very long at all. Basically what it do, does is it binds to the plant. It works its way down into the roots and kills the entire plant, but it does not remain in the soil. It does not go down 200 feet to the water table. Um, it just does not. Now, the problem is, is that if you aren't careful, if you don't use the product correctly, if you bathe and round up half of your life, is it gonna make you sick? Yeah. <laughs> But again, if you use this just for this one season to clear the area, and again, if it's a large area, you, re you really don't have a choice. Uh, you could do some burning, as was mentioned earlier, and, and that sometimes works. But uh, uh, that's my answer on that one. Is there a certain width that prairie should be to be successful? Would a two foot by 15 st strip work okay? It's a great question. Thanks for asking, because uh, the answer is sort of. Um, It'll sort of work, but the, the seeds don't really like to have that cramped of an area. In other words, if you're gonna do it basically along a fence or a strip, try to mark out, let's call it four feet. Um, if, you don't, if you absolutely don't have it, then go ahead. Uh, it just, it's just not gonna uh, thrive and spread as much uh, if you don't have some contiguous ground for that, uh, that, those native plants to work their way into. Uh, let's see, can you go to a home improvement store and find a 10 by 10 piece of black plastic? You know, the answer is I don't know the answer to that, uh, Cindy. Um, I, I buy it in a box. Uh, I bought it at Menards last time. It was uh, 10 feet by 100 feet, uh, and I use it for gardening, um, and I used it for other applications, uh, even in my Monarch tent. Um, so it's something that I just leave in the garage, and when I need a new piece, I have it available. So uh, again, I've got a pretty active uh, gardening slash prairie activity around here, so I have use for it. But I don't know whether you could buy just a small tarp or something like that and do the same thing. I'll have to check that out. Thanks for the question. Uh, let's see, is there anything invasive that would threaten a golf course? Not in our seed mix, that's for sure. And if you go out to Gardner Golf Course, uh, you'll see a absolutely gorgeous um, activity out there of prairie that has been developed in the roughs uh, along, uh, even along the holes on number, uh, you know, what is it, number two um, and number three uh, against uh, Squaw Creek. And again, you have the Squaw Creek uh, Orland Love Prairie down the road a little bit. That is one of the great examples of how beautiful a prairie can be. Uh, let's see. Um, if you have garlic mustard where I want to plant, yikes. <laughs> What's the best way to prepare the bed? Well, so as you all know, garlic mustard is an invasive. It is um, uh, nasty. It is um, something that you have to just work on. So the answer is, is that if you get your, um, let's, let's just assume that you're gonna use the black plastic method. One of the suggestions is then, um, you know, you're gonna have weeds the following spring. And the only thing you can do with garlic mustard is try to pull it early. Uh, bag it and have it taken to the landfill. It is a plant that after even just a month uh, of first coming up in the spring, it will start to put out seed. That seed is viable in your uh, area for something like seven years. So it's, 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 a, it's a 
journey, not a sprint. And I have it all over the place. I basically pull as much as I can. I even mow uh, garlic mustard early in the season because before it puts out seed, that really knocks the plant back and really, really, uh, uh, really helps. Let's see, prepared a quarter acre pollinator plot in late fall 2018. So you're in year uh, two, right? And there's a lot of clover. Yeah, the answer is um, clover is nasty. And uh, again, it's a low lying plant, so it's going to be there. I have clover all the way through most of my prairies, but over time, uh, the native plants contend and they uh, fight with each other and they start to win. So it's a question again of being patient. Um, most prairies don't fail. Uh, I, I will tell you that, uh, you know, if you have to give up, it's usually uh, because the seedbed was not prepared in the first place uh, very well. It's one of those things where, uh, you know, that's not a, that's not a criticism or anything like that. It's just that if you don't have bare soil, and you haven't dealt with the weed seed uh, bed that's in there by either having it bake at high temperature. Uh, in many cases, uh, in fact, let me uh, point you to uh, Prairie Moon Nursery's website. They just had a great article on planting native prairie uh, using black plastic. And their suggestion actually is to leave the plastic on for a couple of months, pull it off for a week, let those weed seeds start to germinate, put the plastic back on again and do that a couple of times. I think that's a good idea if you've got the time and the ability to do so. Okay, I do contend with neighbors who use a fair amount of chemicals. That's not going to change. Plus a back lot line with an ITC transmission line that they maintain. How much concern should I have when locating my plot given these conditions? My plot is good size at one and a half acres. Well, so I guess what I would say is, A, try to locate <laughs> your native habitat as far away from uh, your neighbors as possible. Uh, you know, it, there's going to be some drift. There may even be some damage. Um, ITC uh, is slowly but surely starting to work on native habitat in their rights of way. Um, I know they're actually working with the Fish and Wildlife Service, having recently gotten involved in a uh, agreement on that. Um, but uh, I wish you luck with your property, and uh, I hope it doesn't end up uh, being problematic for you. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, that's for sure. Okay, we've uh, reached kind of the end of our time here. I've taken uh, 45 minutes of your time today.